Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I am thrilled today because I get to talk again with Tarina Maldonado, and you have heard her speak before, and she's a powerful speaker. She's a survivor in every sense of the word. She's empowered with resilience, empathy, and determination by living through child abuse, sexual assault, and leaving a high-demand religion. As a coach and a speaker, Tarina now helps others confidently claim their voice and live an authentic life full of purpose in one-on-one -on -one and corporate settings. Dubbed by Faithwire News, the mom who took on Hollywood in one, and if you want to know that story, go back and listen to her other podcast from last year. Her superpower is her unapologetic vulnerability. Tarina has been featured by dozens of national and international media outlets for her harrowing story and powerful message, including, you guys, listen to this, the New York Times, CNN, ABC, The Guardian, Vanity Fair, Fox, and The Washington Post. I want to be her when I grow up. Welcome, Tarina Maldonado. Thank you, Terry. It's so great to be with you. <laughs> I always love getting to talk with you. It's it's so fun. I'm so glad I'm not talking to myself today. Thank you for being here with me. You're welcome. I was so excited to join you on this topic because I feel like it's one that we're going to have like a fabulous conversation around. <laughs> I do too, especially because this is like your wheelhouse. This is your kind of area of expertise. So I was telling you that the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the patriarchy and Christianity. And last week we talked about why those of us who identify as women or who were socialized as children, as traditional women, why we often struggle. Like I think they've shown that the percentage is in some studies as high as like 65 or 70% of us struggle to speak up. And they found that even when we're the expert in the room, that 45% of us still struggle to speak up. Like even if we are the expert in a room full of predominantly men, we will struggle to speak up and, and say what we need to say. And you have a lot of thoughts on this. So I'm just going to let you just go ahead and hop right in on why you think that is and what your experience is. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, there's been so many studies that have just highlighted what a problem this is. And um, it really is a problem in many facets of our life. Um, when we talk in a business setting, like you were talking about, um, there's been a study that showed um, that when an employee stays silent instead of speaking up, it can cost a company up to $7,500 for every time that that happens within their company. Um, when that happens within relationships, you lose the opportunity for real, authentic, close, vulnerable relationships because you're not showing up as who you are you're holding in and wearing a mask of who you think the person wants to see mm -hmm. so the costs are great and they are varied and it can affect every aspect of our lives as I'm sure that you and our listeners have all experienced yeah if we've come from high demand religion especially I think all of us know what it feels like to self-silence at least to some degree and I think we all know like the anxiety that that produces. There's a certain amount of anxiety of there's something inside of me that I can't tell you and I can't reveal to you. And I hope nobody finds out. It's kind of that secret that I don't want anyone to see behind the mask. Absolutely. And I think it can also lead to a little bit of self gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Like if you can't speak your truth, then you have to make that fit. And so then you start to gaslight yourself on why what you experienced or what you kind of feel your intuition nudging you to say it doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah yeah you're like no 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 it's just me it's fine like it's I'll work with me yeah. yeah yeah okay so if we find ourselves in this position and like we've established I think most of the people who are listening to this podcast have experienced this at some point or another and may still be experiencing this I know I still experience this from time to time how do we start reclaiming our voice? How do we start using it? How do we get over that fear that can sometimes be really crippling of, you know, even beginning to use it for the first time? Uh, so I think people are sometimes surprised when I, I use this as the first step to vocal empowerment, but, and I know you've talked about this before, so we don't have to dive into it, but I really think that self-care and self-love are those first steps. 
because you really have to know deeply within yourself that who you are is good enough and what you have to say and your experiences matter. So mm -hmm. that's the first step is to work on that. But then once we're kind of doing better in those areas, I would say it's um, understanding that there is going to be a physiological reaction mm -hmm. when you start to use your voice, when you speak up. Um, so an example I like to share about this, and I like to preface this by saying, we're not judging my husband harshly because we are both evolving humans. And this was, you know, he's grown since then. So just saying that. Um, but a little bit earlier in our marriage, when I started to learn about boundaries more, and I started to want to kind of create a little bit healthier relationship for him and I, um, I decided I was not comfortable with him yelling at me, which wasn't something that happened frequently, but it would happen. And in the past when it had happened, I would just silently seethe or feel like I deserved it, whatever those things are. Mm -hmm. um, but in this instance, we were on the phone, which I think made it a little bit easier because there wasn't that immediate face-to-face -face presence. Um, and I had to call and tell him about something where I had dropped the ball. Like I was in the wrong. I knew that. I knew that what I was communicating was going to be disappointing and upsetting. And so I shared that with him and then he started yelling and immediately my body was reacting. I was sweating. I had knots in my stomach. Like I physiologically felt the fear and the discomfort, but I still said to him, I understand that you're upset and you totally have every right to be, um, but I'm not okay with you yelling at me. I think it'll probably be better if we continue this conversation when you've gotten home and mm -hmm. then we can talk about it with a little bit more level head. And he was just like silent for a second because this was new, you know, me communicating this boundary, me using my voice and speaking up. And then he was like, okay, fine. <laughs> right. Right. And I hung up the phone and I just like felt like crying. Yeah. And, and that was the physiological response. And sometimes when we have had those types of physiological um, responses, it's be been because we've been in situations that are unsafe. And so even though I was totally safe, I was not doing anything wrong. What I was doing was actually helping us to create a healthier relationship. I still experienced feelings physiologically that were very similar to what I would experience when my dad was yelling when I was a child and that wasn't a safe situation. Yeah. And so to understand that you're going to have a physiological reaction and sometimes it's going to be like mine where it's like your full body is like, sweating and in knots and you get out of that situation and you're still like processing that is really important to go into with that knowledge because then when that happens you're not like I need to stop this isn't safe I'm I'm doing something wrong because I'm feeling this way you yeah. know this is part of the experience for two reasons one you're doing something new and two you're likely triggering a physiological response from a trauma response because you've been in a si similar situation, but you're now rewriting the narrative where you're taking power in your voice. I am so glad you brought that up because I think you're absolutely right. Even as you've been talking, I'm revisiting times in the past where it's been hard for me to speak up. And I think all of us, if we're having a hard time speaking up, it's because we have experienced something in the past that has felt traumatic, whether it's been big T or little t trauma it, you know, it could be the kid, you know, in third grade that made fun of us whenever we stuttered when we were trying to speak in class or give an answer. It could be, you know, something like a parent yelling at us. It could be something like, um, you know, getting turned down for an interview because we botched a, a job interview or something like we have something that that voicelessness is tied to something that makes it feel dangerous or like fearful or anxiety ridden or even shameful to speak up. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I remember when I first started trying to speak out loud, 
yeah, I, I felt like maybe I'm doing something wrong because I started when I was still at church. And so feeling like I wouldn't be feeling this way if this was the right thing to do. But really what was going on was I was working against long-term programming that it was not okay to use your voice. Right. And many of us have been taught that quote unquote, bad feelings, negative feelings are from Satan. And so then if you're stepping into your voice and feeling these feelings, then what does that mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it's important to note that feelings are just feelings. And um, yes, they can be messengers, but they can also be messengers of this is something new that needs to be um, changed. And so there, um, if you do identify a specific incident that is tied to being held back, you can rewrite that story for yourself and you can reenact that situation in a way that leaves you feeling empowered. So say for instance, that situation with my husband, I hadn't spoken up, but here I am in a situation where I'm wanting to, but I know that that failure to speak up and advocate for myself is creating feelings of hesitancy and is holding me back from my ability to speak up. What I can do is I can put myself in that situation. I can remember that I was standing in the kitchen. I can remember that my hands were still a little damp because I had stopped doing the dishes and I can take some deep breaths and really try and put myself in the emotion of that. Mm -hmm. And I can even exaggerate a little bit. And instead of playing it out the way that I did in real life, I could say, no, Mm -hmm. you need to stop right now it is not okay for you to yell at me. I am not a child. I am not your subordinate. I am a human being and I am your wife. You need to treat me with love and respect. And that does not include yelling. And you feel those feelings as they come up. You feel that adrenaline coming into your system. You say whatever you wish you would have said. And then you take a deep breath and you literally shake your body because that's Mm going to help you release that adrenaline. That's going to help you release all of the emotions from that situation. And you've just rewritten that situation in your body and in your mind. And that can help you to kind of rewrite that story and empower you then to feel more comfortable using your voice when you're in a situation similar to this one that wrote that story for you that I'm not brave enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not valuable enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this idea. And I already know I'm going to have listeners who are going to write me and say, so how exactly do I do that? Do I do it out loud? Do I do it in my head? Do I journal it? Is there a more effective way to go about this process of rewriting our stories and then shaking our body afterward? What would you say to that? So I would say it depends on you individually. If verbally physically reenacting this is going to be super triggering for you, then that's not the safe way for you to do it and start with journaling, start with it in your mind. But the most powerful way to do it is going to be to call in that physical response Mm -hmm. and reenact that to role play that situation with yourself, with your mind's eye, remembering that situation but also take into consideration where you are in your own emotional strength and healing and do what's safest for you. Thank you so much for saying that and reminding people to listen to what feels the safest and the best for them. I know that I had an experience with a therapist where there were a lot of things I couldn't say to a parent growing up. And as a child had learned a lot of silencing And they stood in for my parent and I got to say the things that I wanted to say that I'd always wanted to say that I think if I hadn't had a chance to do this with the therapist, I would probably still want to say and ways I wanted to advocate for myself, but they stood in that place and just getting to say them to someone who was pretending to be my parent really released a lot of that. I really don't need to say it anymore because the time has come and gone and I just got to say everything teenage me wanted to say, and it was super freeing. So love that you brought that up. Absolutely. It can be a really powerful experience. It can. It was, I I remember just crying and, and like shaking, like you said, and just feeling like, oh, okay, I got that out. It's almost like a huge, heavy piece of furniture that I couldn't move by myself. And then somebody helped me 
like take it down the flight of stairs and like put it on the curb. So yeah, it was so yeah, nice to be rid of that. That's a beautiful analogy. Let's take the <laughs> ugly ottoman outside, please. <laughs> yes, like let's get it out the door. And it did sit there for a little bit. I think there were a couple of times I like peeked out and was like, oh, yeah, it's it's still there. But over time, it just kind of, someone took it and went away. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the first thing we start with is self-love. And we learn that we're worthy. And the second thing we do is we begin, I guess, changing the narrative in our head. And we can go back and change some of those stories. What do we do next? Uh, I think it's really important to sit with the fact that there are going to be people who don't like what you have to say. Ooh, okay. Let's talk about this. (laughs) Right? Because one of the biggest things that keeps us quiet is fear. And one of those big fears is that somebody's not going to like me if I say this. Guess what? That's going to happen. You know, Mm -hmm. there's nearly 9 billion people in the world it's literally impossible for everybody to like you um and it's impossible for everybody that you know to like everything that you have to say and every opinion that you have but that doesn't mean that your opinions that your values that your experiences are wrong it Mm -hmm. just means that where they're coming from that doesn't align with them and that's okay and that's beautiful that's what adds to the diversity of humanity but it's also really hard to Mm -hmm. confront and experience and so I think if you can sit with that knowledge and that fact that there are going to be people that are going to hear what you have to say and they're not going to like it and just sit with that for a minute it can help you feel more courageous and more empowered to start to speak up and I like to invite my clients when doing this to kind of go through the five whys So if you're specifically worried about speaking up to a spouse or a parent about a specific topic, ask yourself why five times. And typically by the time you get to the fifth why, you're going to get to the root of what that is. And maybe that is then the experience that you need to replay (laughs) and like take your power back on. Um, But it can be really empowering to just kind of sit with this, like, There's people who are not going to want to like what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And when you've already cultivated that self-love and that self-care, you're going to know that that's okay because that doesn't determine your value or your worth or your worthiness of love and acceptance and belonging because that's inherent to you being human. Yeah. Um, And so I think that that can really help, help you feel empowered to kind of walk through that a little bit in your brain, like somebody is not going to like what I have to say. And to really get to a space where you're like, that's going to be okay. Does that mean that it's going to be easy? Does it mean that it's going to be fun and pleasant when somebody disagrees with you or really pushes back and doesn't like what you have to say? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Um, So not to invalidate or give this expectation that having this realization and this acceptance that people aren't going to like you is going to make it easy when that happens but it does make it a little bit easier and it does empower you to be able to claim your voice a little bit when you realize that one of the reasons why we fear speaking out is because we've been programmed to be liked. We've been programmed to be perfect. We've been programmed to fall in line. And so when we start to break those rules, people aren't going to like it, but that's okay. Yeah. Well, and you bring up some really interesting points here, which is I think many of us do have a deep fear that when we peel that onion, which is what I call those five whys, which is, you know, starting with that outside layer and then like asking why and peeling down to the next layer and continuing to peel the onion. Um, I think many of us really have like a fear of abandonment or a fear of being alone. And so I'm so glad you talked about starting with the self-love piece because as we build as we build that, we're able to tolerate and kind of push back, I think, on some of those fears a little bit. But when we get to that fear of abandonment, I find that it's really helpful to make a plan with fear because fear is trying to keep us safe. It's trying to help us experience the least amount of harm possible. So realizing there are going to be some people that don't like what I have to say, what will I do? when that happens. And there's 
I found that there were a variety of things when I started this podcast. That was one of my big fears is I'm going to say things that people don't like, and I'm going to say them very publicly. And I'm sure people are going to comment and they do, they do. So what am I going to do? I remember going through different scenarios that I was the most afraid of. Like, what am I going to do if it's just a really, really, really mean stranger? And I remember being like, it doesn't matter. They don't know me. So whatever they're railing against is not me. It's whatever's going on inside of them. And I was like, what if it's somebody I'm really close to? And realizing like, okay, well, it depends on how they're disagreeing with me. If they're disagreeing with me in a way that's very respectful of my humanity and is just like, this is my point of view and I don't agree with you and I don't like what you're saying, I can have a conversation with that. But if it's really dehumanizing, like we're going to be having a different conversation that's setting some serious boundaries, right? Because disagreeing with me is fine. Treating me like I'm not human is not okay. So like, let's have a conversation about that. So kind of thinking through, like, what am I actually afraid of? Like you said, peeling that, that onion and, and asking those five whys allowed me to figure out the different scenarios I was really afraid of, and then kind of sort them and decide what I would do and realize some of those actually weren't fears at all. If a stranger has some really mean things to say to me, it does not matter. But if, you know, someone close to me, that was more of a fear. And how would I handle that? And having a plan kind of allowed my nervous system to relax and be like, okay, so if that happens, we know what to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I sometimes recommend to clients to worst case scenario it (laughs) and not for people who maybe already have a tendency towards high anxiety or ruminating spiraling thoughts. Um, Although sometimes it has been helpful in those situations, Mm -hmm. but to really look at it like, worst case scenario what happens and always even when you get to that worst case scenario if you've built a secure relationship with yourself you know it'll be hard but it'll be okay and so that's kind of part of that planning component too is like well what's the worst that could happen and really a lot of times when you look at it it's not as bad as it feels like when you really logistically look at what's the worst that's going to happen if I step up and I say, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with this, or this has been my experience. And it's kind of contradictory to what you have thought and what you've believed. But this is this is actually the experience that I have had. And you find out maybe it's not quite as bad as I thought when I wasn't fully thinking when I was just worrying and ruminating. Yeah, it is funny how our fears do that when we're just like thinking and ruminating and it's we're in that fight or flight place. And so we're not critically thinking about it. It's just there and it feels scary, but we haven't really looked at it. It's like we're looking at it from our peripheral vision and it looks big and scary and shadowy. And so if we can sit with it and really allow ourselves to confront it and to plan with it and listen to it, like we get to look at it you know front on and actually it's a little kid with a a monster mask on and we're like oh okay you looked scary over there from my my side vision but when I look at you straight on you're not as scary as I thought you were absolutely yes (laughs) yeah oh okay this is all such great stuff because I think so many of us we get wrapped up in in those fears that we don't allow ourselves to really slow down, which I think is really important to slow down the process and to give ourselves time to feel through things and to consciously think through things and plan with them. What is your process to do that? I think a lot of the things that we've talked about kind of um, figuring out um, why I want to speak up about something is important. Because there's been times when I've wanted to say something and then I think about why do I want to say something in this particular situation and environment and is it going to be productive? Because there's times when it's not going to be productive and then I may choose not to say anything in that moment. But when I feel like it's going to be productive in helping me to feel more seen and heard. It's going to be productive in helping relationships move forward. It's going to be more productive in communicating ideas and my values that are most important to me. 
then I step forward with that. And so no, like figuring out whether it's worth it or not, making sure that you're in a safe space to do that. Um, and that can mean psychologically safe as well as physically safe. Mm -hmm. Um, and then figuring out what do I really want to communicate? Like, do I really want to tell them that they're wrong or is it more important that I communicate that the way that they're speaking is not like speaking to me is not something that I'm comfortable with and not something that I'm willing to accept because it's degrading and it's minimizing and it's gaslighting. Am I trying to say something because I want to correct them or because I want them to know this is how I choose to be treated and this is how I accept communication to me. And so mm. figuring out the why behind what you want to communicate and what you truly want to communicate can be really helpful. <laughs> And so those are some important questions that you can kind of sit with, like, is this safe? Is this really important to me? And what am I truly wanting to communicate? Mm, I think that that's really powerful because I can look back at myself, particularly at the beginning of religious transition and just... I think because we put, I put a cork in my voice for a long time. And it's almost like once I uncorked my voice, like everything came out unfiltered and it sprayed everywhere and it damaged relationships where I probably could have said or communicated things in a way that helped them feel safe too. Cause I ended up making several people that I love feel unsafe because I just said whatever, however, um, and didn't really stop to think about what did I want to communicate and why, which I think are really, really important. Now, I, I'm going to ask you a question. I have at least a person every week say, how do I speak up and tell, like, how do I correct the stories that people have in their head about me? Like, what can I say to them? And I can see by your face, you already, like, you're going to have something great to say. And I have a feeling it's going to be something similar to what I would say. But many people, and I know I was right there in those shoes, you know, almost six years ago of how do I correct the stories for other people? How do I speak up? How do I like set the record straight? Because I think that's one of the times when we really want to use our voice sometimes for the first time after we leave high demand religion. So what would you say to that? I would say take a beat and look at the why and why is it just because you care about what they think of you because if that's the case does it really matter that much because there is absolutely no way that you can guarantee that you're going to change somebody else's opinion and view of you it just can't be done that's mm -hmm. developed in their own brain from so many different factors, a lot, including their own personal experiences. And you may have triggered something in them that makes their view of you unmovable. Yeah. And that's a possibility. Um, and so really, like, I just feel like that's a losing battle. Um, yeah. And the best way to do that is just by living authentically and showing people who you truly are and giving them evidence of you being a good person. And if that doesn't help them to see you for who they are and help change that narrative, then it might not happen. And again, this depends on the level of relationship. Like if you're talking about your parent who now thinks that you are being controlled by Satan and you've been deceived, you know, like you might want to have some important conversations to try and correct that. And those you want to do very, very mindfully and very lovingly and um, from a place of only trying to help them to know you better, not you trying to correct them. Mm -hmm. And um, with lots of understanding for where they're seeing you from. So you're not, I mean, there may be a lot of anger and hurt and rejection that you feel at the viewpoint that they now have of you you're going to have to try and set that aside for a second and know that what you really need to address is that you want to move this relationship forward and you want to continue it. And so what are going to be the most important things to communicate to do that? Mm. Are there things that maybe 
so for example, my religious, I mean, my political views have also changed as my religious views have changed. And um, my mom was here and she started talking about some political things and my kids were there and I really didn't want them hearing that. And so what I said to her in that moment was, you know what, we have very different opinions about this now and I value our relationship more than I value what either of us think about this. So it might be better for us just to not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then we change the topic. So you can see, like, does it matter if you guys align on your religious views? Does it matter if you align on some social issues? Or does it matter more that you're able to find your common threads that you still find where your values align? where your experiences overlap and that you can take those and move forward with those. And so that's going to want to be the focus of trying to change somebody's narrative because they might be afraid for you just as you're hurt by them. And so you're going to try and repair this relationship by finding the things that you have in common and focusing on those and moving forward. But when it comes to changing somebody's perspective of you, that really is in a lot of ways, a losing battle. And so you just have to know that regardless of what anybody thinks of you, the story that they tell themselves is exactly that. It's a story and you know who you are. You know what your values are and you know that your worth is not contingent upon them seeing you as a good person. Mm, yeah, Kevin has a, a saying that no one ever sees us clearly. They always see us through the lens of their own lived experience. And so, you know, someone might see us maybe a little more like we are because they've taken the time to like get to know us and be curious and they ask curiosity questions, usually because they're okay with themselves. Like we typically can't tolerate curiosity for someone else and tolerate whatever might come up if we haven't also started practicing that with ourselves. But he said, even then, he was like, even as well as I know you, I know you through my lived experience as Kevin with you. He was like, I can't fully understand what's going on inside of your head. He was like, so even the way I see you, whether it's praising you or whether it's being frustrated with you is through my own bias and lived experience. Even though I probably have had more lived experience with you than anyone else on the planet. And I'm like, hmm, that's true. So yeah, I loved that idea, though, that even the people who love us the most and want the best for us still are seeing us through the lens of their lived experience and their their own stuff. Yeah. And so that's where that foundation of self-worth, self-love um, comes into play because it can be hurtful and it can be really disappointing and sad. But when you have that foundation there, you're able to navigate that. You're able to survive that. Whereas if your worth is attached to somebody else's love, that's hard to survive when mm -hmm. they're pulling their love back because they no longer agree with your life decisions. Yeah. And I think that's what most of us are chasing after when we want to correct that narrative is we want that love, that validation. We want that back because a lot of us, I think we're raised to be people pleasers and to get our internal worth from external validation. Do you have anything uh, you want to say about absolutely. people pleasing? <laughs> I think that people pleasing um, causes us to communicate in a variety of different ways. And a lot of times those are ways that are, are inauthentic to who we are. And I think this happens um, for a few different reasons. We're afraid of somebody seeing us for who we are, which is then rooted in that fear of rejection and abandonment and not being accepted for who we are. Or we want to appear a certain way so that people will like us because we think that's what they want us to be. Or we want to manipulate a situation, which we're mm -hmm. all human and guilty of this at times. Like maybe if I say or behave this way, then I'll get this outcome. And so if you can kind of look at what are these things that I'm putting on in trying to make people happy? And um, yeah, I just, people pleasing is such a big one because this is also part of it. Like we, like our lizard brain, our brain that we have carried with us through all of evolution that has these programmings 
for helping us to literally stay alive, one of that plays into people pleasing because way, 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 way back, you literally would die if you were rejected by your tribe or your family. Like you couldn't, you could not survive on your own. You needed that group of people to survive, to provide protection, to provide food, to help with shelter. Like you literally would die without that. And so there is a part of our lizard brain that still feels that fear in a way almost to the point of I'm going to die if my friends don't like me anymore. Yeah. Well, we live in the year 2022. You're not going to (laughs) die. Like, (laughs) You're still going to be safe. You're still going to be able to get food. And we're connected with a lot more people. You can find new people to love and support you. But it is very valid that you feel that way because our brains are trying to keep us alive. And part of that is by making sure that the people that used to be essential to keep us alive like us. And so I think just acknowledging that it's okay that I feel this way, even if it might be a little ridiculous, but this is just my primal brain trying to keep me alive. And you can even, sometimes I I do this with my brain. I'll be like, thank you so much for trying to protect me. I am safe and I am in control now. So we're just going to go ahead and let that go. (laughs) Because it's much more kinder than like beating yourself up over the fact that you're you're really worried about whether your neighbor is going to like you or whether the person who went to church with you before is still going to like you. It's much kinder to say, thank you for trying to protect me. I appreciate that effort. We're going to go ahead and just let that go because I am safe and I am in control Mm -hmm. and move forward rather than trying to beat yourself up over this thought that you're having that you want people to like you. Like, This is just part of our human experience to want to be liked and to want to be connected and involved with people. And so there's, there should never be any self-shaming that happens when you feel that. But what you can do is instead acknowledge where that's coming from. Maybe show yourself a little love when there's a little extra fear or anxiety there, and then let your higher self, your greater knowledge, your your presence right now, take over and really step in with that, um, that it's just okay. If somebody doesn't like me, it's okay. And I can make decisions that are good for me, even if I know that that's going to cause other people to not like me. Yeah. I love the idea of being kind and compassionate to all of the things that come up inside of ourselves, because all of them are trying to serve a purpose and keep us alive and safe and to experience the least amount of hurt possible. So, right. And when we can bring kindness, compassion, and curiosity into looking into why am I so worried about speaking up or why is there so much fear or anxiety or sadness when I think about speaking these things, that's going to help us to grow and to really look deeper into who we are and what's making us work versus if we bring in shaming ourselves, Mm -hmm. all that's going to do is make the situation worse. I tell my clients all the time, nobody has ever shamed themselves into being a better person. Nope. Well, and what I think of is we started the very first step you said was to build a relationship of trust and love and respect with ourselves that that's where we start from. And if we're beating ourselves with the shame stick, we're not going to feel safe with ourselves. So we're not going to feel safe with other people. And it's, we're, we're going to keep people pleasing. We're going to keep perpetuating that problem because what allows us, I feel like in many ways to venture, to speak our truth is knowing that regardless, I'm still safe with me. Like I still like me and I'll still be here for me. It'll be okay. If I stick my foot in my mouth, if I say something that I later regret, like I've still got my back, it'll be all right. I'll work through it. Yeah. I think another component to that, you just said, if I I say something that I shouldn't have, um, another fear that we have is maybe that we're going to cause harm. Mm -hmm. I know that as I've stepped into the space of being a little bit more vocal around my allyship um, for marginalized people. There, there is fear that I might, from my space of privilege, say something that unintentionally causes harm. 
but I also know that my intentions are good and that I am capable of taking accountability and responsibility for anything that may cause harm. And this is something that I practice even in my own home, which I will say your own home is going to be your perfect playground for practicing your vocal empowerment. Start with the people who are closest to you and who love you the most because they are going to give you the most grace. Mm -hmm. Um, So with my children, I cause harm. I'm so imperfect and I'm with them all the time. It's only natural. And I also have learned to say, I am so sorry that I yelled at you. Um, I have been really overstimulated. I've been stressed. And instead of seeing that and stepping away from this situation and taking a moment to regulate myself and get more centered and calm, I yelled at you and that's not okay. You deserve better than that. And so I'm really sorry. And I'll try and do better in the future. I just took accountability and my kids are like, it's okay, mom. I love you. still. you're the best because they're kids, but that gives me time to practice taking accountability when I have caused harm. And it gives me time to practice Um, doing better. And this can be the perfect place to practice speaking up. If your kids are consistently leaving their dishes on the table after dinner, and you are silently seething every time you're cleaning up after your entire family, instead of speaking up, take your voice back. And in a loving way at dinner, say, you know, I noticed something about myself. When I am cleaning up after dinner and I'm picking up after all of you. It makes me feel really bad. It gives me feelings that I don't really like. And it also takes away my time from being with you guys. And so what I would really like to do is make it so that I feel better in the evenings and that we have more time together as a family. So I would like to ask you guys to please make sure you take your dishes to the table after dinner. This is going to help me so much. Mm -hmm. And I would love for that to be something that we can work on together. Can you guys maybe help me be accountable for that and help me remember, like, however you want to word it, but just take that opportunity in this very low risk situation to use your voice, right? Like, it's very low risk to say, hey, I need y'all to help me get the dishes to the table. (laughs) Before you say, hey, I've completely transitioned out of the faith that I was raised in my entire life. (laughs) Yeah, taking those small steps forward and realizing I can use my voice with my kids because I think many of us even swallow the words we have to say until we reach our boiling point. At least that was me many years ago was to like swallow, 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 just keep doing what I thought was expected of me to be like the perfect mom, perfectionism and people pleasing. They're so closely tied together. And then I would reach like my breaking point and then I'd explode and then I'd apologize profusely and then we'd repeat, right? Like it's like I'd vent the pressure and then we'd repeat. And it has been really empowering, not just for me, but for my kids to be able to speak and say, this is bothering me and this is how I feel about it. Can we make a plan together to like fix this problem? Because what we're doing right now isn't working for me. And it's making me feel frustrated, angry, resentful, whatever. It's been really cool because I've watched them model that as well and come back and say, I don't like this. Can we work together to find a plan that works for both of us? Because the way we're doing it right now really frustrates me. My son just came to me and he was like, you always pick me up 15 minutes after school is out. And that's really frustrating me because... I want to get home quicker so I can have a snack. And I was like, that is a good point. I was like, I've been trying to avoid the traffic, but maybe we can find a way to meet in the middle. And we came up with a great solution that works for both of us. So I get to avoid the traffic. He gets to be picked up on time. And yeah, I don't have to be stuck in a traffic jam. Right. And when we start to practice things at home, it absolutely starts to teach our children so that they don't have to go through all of this at 40 years old, learning to Mm -hmm. reprogram things. They just get to know how to communicate in a healthy way. And so it can even be helpful to maybe like the next night say, guys, I just have to share with you. Like that was a really big thing for me to say that I don't like having to clean up all the dishes because normally I've just kept that to myself and been angry, but it felt really good to say that out loud. So thank you guys for letting me express that. Like, 
then you're normalizing the challenging part of speaking up too. You're normalizing that it can be hard even for mom to say what she Mm -hmm. wants, but it's still okay. And mom still said that. Yeah. And that mom's human and she has needs too, because that was one of the things one of my younger kids said, he was like, oh, I didn't know you had needs. I just, you're just realized superwoman. (laughs) But I think there is kind of this idea that like, there's certain things women just do and it's not work. It's just like, we're just living. And I think women are very aware that that is not just living, that that's actually work too. So yeah, even like telling my kids that I have needs for quiet. Like there are times where I'm like, I'm a little emotionally overwhelmed. I'm going to be in my room for the next 15 minutes. Don't knock unless like someone's hurt or there's a fire. Okay. I just need to like be alone with my thoughts and like center myself and then I'll come back out and letting them know that that's okay for me to go and take a break and have some time to myself just to think and be in the quiet. And absolutely. I love that so much. (laughs) Yeah. I've heard them saying that to one another too. My oldest is an introvert, loves the quiet. And I've heard him say, I've listened to you for 30 minutes now, but now I need to not listen to you anymore for at least 30 minutes. So I'm going to be in my room with my Legos. My door is going to be closed. Don't knock unless like you've forgotten something in my room. But if you come to get something in my room, don't talk to me. I need 30 minutes of no talking. <laughs> so Those are some beautiful communication and boundary skills that your children have learned. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. I'm so proud that. of them. I'm so proud of me too. Look at us learning all these <laughs> new skills. So we have a few more minutes before the end of the episode. You brought up something really interesting when we were talking about preparing for this episode. And I'm so curious what it is because I've never heard it before. You were talking about communication archetypes. What is that? Ooh, yes. And you kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, So in the um, vocal empowerment system that I'm certified to facilitate, which is um, step, step into your moxie, speak up and influence. Um, we teach about three different communication archetypes. So there are bunny, dragon, and cheetah. I think often as women, we are taught that we need to be bunnies. Bunnies are submissive. Bunnies are small. Bunnies are meek. Bunnies are quiet. Does this sound like what we were all taught that we were supposed to be? Oh, yeah. And then there's the dragon. The dragon is hard. The dragon is harsh. The dragon is loud. The dragon is big. The dragon can be scary. And neither of those is going to be most effective. Um, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we talk about mama bear and that's kind of that dragon energy. But what we really want to cultivate is cheetah energy. And so I don't know if you know very much about cheetahs, but cheetahs in the wild are pretty amazing creatures. They like to rest from a perching place where they can see what's going on around them. So they like to be observers and they rest and rejuvenate themselves. And then when there is a moment where action is needed, they are fast. They are there when they they are needed, they get right there, they take care of it, and then they go back to resting again. So these cheetahs, they care for themselves, they observe, they don't step in when it's not needed, but when they're needed, they're there in a clear, quick way. And so when we relate this to our communication, um, being a cheetah means being an observer. It means taking that time to ask those questions that we talked about, like, is this important? Why is this important? What do I need to communicate? It means that we don't show up in bunny energy questioning ourselves. A lot of women think that they're speaking up, but they lead with, uh, well, in my opinion, mm, so I think instead of just clearly saying, like you were talking about, these women experts will be in the room and still not speak up. And a lot of times, even when they do, women are guilty of minimizing their own their own expertise and their own genius with phrases such as, well, I think, or maybe, 
Or is it okay if I share instead of just confidently stepping in and saying, you know, in these situations, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And it means that we don't show up in the dragon who's coming in saying, you know what, you have to listen to me right now. I am going to take up all the space in the room and I'm going to make sure that everybody hears what I have to say. I'm going to make sure that everybody agrees and I'm going to make sure that I get my way only. The cheetah is much more um, confident. The cheetah is more sure. Um, The cheetah is more win-win energy where the dragon is very like, I need to be heard and I need everybody to like me and I need everything to be right. Whereas the cheetah can come into those type of situations and realize that there can be compromise, that we can disagree as long as we do it respectfully and um, with good, healthy boundaries involved. And so stepping into that cheetah energy is stepping into this centered presence that's going to communicate what is most important in a way that is respectful not only to others, but also to yourself, your own experience and your own expertise. Oh, I love that. You can't see it because my chair is in the way, but this picture right there is a cheetah. So I bought it right after reading Glennon Doyle's Untamed. Yes. And I just like, this has become a symbol for me, the cheetah, Um, not just because of her book, but I have been learning more about cheetahs and they are incredible creatures and they are like balanced is the word that comes to mind for me. So hardworking, very balanced. Yeah. Hardworking, but willing to rest. Um, They're social creatures, but they also can be found alone in the wild. So they kind of do both. Like they're, they're really cool creatures. Um, I like what you said about the energy of the cheetah is about being respectful to others and ourselves simultaneously. Because I feel like for the last several weeks, we've been talking about masculine and feminine energy and about like the expectations and stereotypes for masculine and for feminine. And I feel like the bunny energy really does kind of encapsulate that stereotype for feminine energy. And the dragon really encapsulates that stereotype for masculine energy and we are full human beings we have masculine and feminine in us and the way that we express both of those things is that that balance between them that yin and that yang that ability to get things done to like express ourselves but also to like find that win-win and that way to compromise and that way to like live in a common space together with one another yes and I think all too often, we, when we've come from this bunny energy and being told that that's what's ideal for us as women, we think that then what we need to do is be the dragon, to be loud, to be heard, to be strong, to be forceful, when really that can be just as damaging and just as ineffective as the bunny, but just in different ways been there done that I told you about leaving the church and just being like yes even um so I grew up in an abusive home and in that my my dad was the primary abuser and my mom was more in the victim space and so when I got married um one of the first times that we had a friend over I totally flipped into more of I won't even say dragon but it was more in the like I want my friend to know that I'm the, I'm the one that wears the pants in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And in my head, it was because that was the lesser of two evils. Like I wasn't going to be the victim. And so after my friend left, my husband said to me, he was like, I really didn't like the way you treated me when your friend was here. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my goodness. Like I hadn't even realized what I had done, but Mm -hmm. in my attempts to not be a victim in our marriage, even though neither of us were being abusive, but coming from that background, that was where my brain went. I mm-hmm. turned into the mean antagonistic, almost abuser in yeah. that situation. And so I was really thankful that he stepped into his vocal empowerment in that moment and told me that so that I could see that because I literally had not even realized that's what I was doing. But as I paused to sit and sit with that and see what was happening. Why did I do that? That's not me. 
I realized that that's what had happened and the reasoning behind that. And so I was able to kind of process and work through that. But yeah, it can be really tempting to swing from one one side all the way to the other when really a happy medium is really what's going to be the most productive, successful, and bring the most happiness into our lives. Absolutely. Yeah. When we come from structures of power over, which is what patriarchy is, which is what, you know, if you're in an abusive dynamic, there's a power over dynamic. There are two dichotomies that we see. We see those that have the power that dominate, and we see those that are submissive and don't have the power. And so when we don't want to be the submissive one that doesn't have the power anymore, we do often swing to, well, I don't want to be this, so I must be this. And then, and I don't think it really uh, computes sometimes that there is a place in the middle where we have power with, and we share power and we, you know, collaborate, we communicate together and we find ways that work for both of us, that one isn't dominating over the other. We're working together to create something that works for both of us. But I think when you come from an abusive or a power dynamic where there's power over, it doesn't even like, it doesn't register that that's even an option until we see it modeled or we read about it or we go to therapy and they're like, oh, here's a new way. Which is why I am just so passionate about helping others to take power in their voice in a healthy way, because I've seen and I've experienced myself how challenging it can be to find that middle when you only know the two extremes. And if you have spent your whole life being silenced and silencing yourself and feeling like you couldn't speak up, it's very, very easy to then swing into things that you're later going to go, man, I wish I would have known better so I could have done better. And so I love helping people know better so that they can do better before they have to go and repair some harm that they did. (laughs) Yeah. Well, if people want to work with you, where can they find you? How, how can they follow you on your incredible journey, teaching people to be true to themselves and be able to speak their truth? Yeah. So the best place would be to go to my website. It's just my name, TarinaMaldonado.com. From there, you can find links to my social media, which I love to have fun on and share um, advice and tips and just to have a little fun there. And I've been doing um, monthly little webinars that are free. So if anybody wants to hop on, the next one is going to be on the 22nd of October or November this month. Um, And so we're going to be talking all about boundaries. So if anybody wanted to hop on and learn some more about boundaries, they can do that. Um, Also on my website, I have a free self-care and journal workbook that you can snag and have to kind of help work you through some of those first steps of learning to care for yourself and some good journaling prompts for you. Um, Oh, I love it. And I love your reels. I was telling her before we started hitting record that I love watching her do her reels. She obviously is having so much fun whenever she makes them. You can just see it on her face and in the energy that comes through the screen. So please go to her website, go and follow her on Instagram. Um, Go pick up the self-care and journal workbook because, you know, all of these little tools, they all help us move along. We're all still learning and evolving and we will be for the rest of our lives, learning and evolving and getting to know ourselves better. And it gets to be this wonderful adventure. Thank you so much, Tarina, for coming on the podcast. This was so much fun. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thanks for such a great conversation. No, I, I think I learned so much. I've got notes over here. So thank you. Thank you. And we will see you all next Sunday.